Pakistan is ready to make peace with its neighbours, including India. The Prime Minister, Imran Khan, says economic diplomacy will now be at the heart of foreign affairs. It's all part of the country's new national security policy, but will it work? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Peter Dobby. Pakistan's Prime Minister has launched the country's first ever national security policy. It seeks to shift the focus away from the military to what you might call a citizen-centric framework, and it aims to have economic security as its core. Imran Khan says Pakistan has been in dire need of a strategy that ensures the protection of its people and guards economic interests. Opposition parties have criticised the government for not taking their input into account when formulating the policy. We'll begin our main discussion in a moment. First, let's take a closer look at the economic challenges that lie ahead. Pakistan has topped the list of 10 countries with the highest external debt, rising unemployment and poverty. And the pandemic has exacerbated that, pushing the nation's poverty levels to nearly 40%. The government is struggling with inflation. In October, the Pakistani rupee dropped to a record low against the US dollar. The country has also been facing skyrocketing prices of essential commodities, oil, gas and wheat. And Pakistan is also grappling with the economic fallout from the volatility across the border in Afghanistan after the Taliban took over last year. First, joining us from Lahore is Moeed Yusuf, National Security Advisor to Imran Khan, the Pakistani Prime Minister. Musad Yusuf, welcome to Inside Story. Looking at the non-redacted 50-page published version, the abridged version of this new policy, big on large sweeping ideas, very, very short on detail, how do you make it work? Thank you. First of all, <clears throat> let's understand that without big ideas, um, or sweeping ideas, as you call them, you're not going to have a direction. We've had multiple, multiple sectoral policies like any other country, but we were missing an umbrella which told us, which told our citizens, and which told the world Pakistan's statement of intent for itself. That's what the, un, uh, or the abridged version that you have tells you. It tells you that this is a country that wants to move to have peace in the region, a country that's focused on economic security, on geoeconomics uh, in tandem with geostrategy, looking at development partnerships, looking at using its location at the crossroads of South Asia, Central Asia, West Asia for connectivity. That's the future where Pakistan wants to go. Now, when you talk about what are you going to do to get there, there's a whole menu of things, specific things that, of course, are not going to in the public document, which will be worked on on set timelines to take the direction that, that we've laid out. But this is not a policy that says that we're going to do one part of uh, national security ahead of the other. The real issue for Pakistan is our national resource pie is not large enough to cater adequately to our people. We are uh, the fifth largest country in the world, 220 million people. So that resource pie has to increase through better economic performance through better exports, through better foreign direct investment and remittances. We've got to work out that external imbalance part, and then we can redistribute much more to our human welfare okay. and to our traditional and, and military security. So this is, this is going forward a paradigm shift, not in terms of moving from one area to another, but getting everything in line so that everybody gains. All, okay, all, but Mr. Yusuf, uh, just to interrupt you there for a second, please, sir. Why not, if, if it's a paradigm shift, why do it only in English? Because both documents are composed, written in English. Why not do it in Urdu, the language of your country? Because the stakeholders in all this, just let me finish, the stakeholders in all this are the people of Pakistan. And why keep so much of it secret? Just publish the whole thing so everyone can get involved in this conversation. So first of all, uh, you're absolutely right. And the summary document has already been translated into, into Urdu and the larger document is also being translated and will be out because that's exactly what we want. We want a debate in the country. We want intellectual input. We, we want critique. So that is happening. 
As far as why not lay out everything, no country does it. Uh, there are strategies that are put out, mother documents of this nature, of course, because they can be interpreted and misinterpreted, and then uh, it's national security policy. There are certain things that actually are never made public. But we haven't put out a summary of two pages. We put out a 50, 60 page document, which lays out very clearly the direction of where Pakistan is going. And each sentence in each section, if you read it, you will know that if you put policy actions uh, beneath those, that's exactly how policies are implemented. Okay. That part, of course, is will remain classified. Your short published at the moment version talks about a civil slash military consensus. So you, you you want to you want to get people to hang on to that word. There's there's a broad consensus here, I guess. But the consensus didn't include the opposition politicians in the parliament in Islamabad. This sounds like a root and branch reinvention of the country post let's call it what it is, post-partition, going back to 1947. This is like Imran Khan is saying, I want to take the country to its next iteration, its next version, what the country will become in a generation or two generations. How can you say you've got a consensus if the opposition politicians are not involved in this? That doesn't make any sense. First of all, policymaking uh, involves not only the government, not only civil military, our provinces, it's Pakistan is a... Uh, federal structure in terms of governance. Uh, not all provinces are governed by the ruling party in the centre. Uh, in addition, uh, the parliament has a committee on national security where such matters are heard. This policy was taken there. We made a presentation uh, and everybody who was there gave input. So it is not correct. I think that information is wrong. Other than that, politics is politics. Uh, I don't belong to that world. The opposition will say what it says. This is a document that no Pakistani government, I can guarantee you, will go back on. Are there not two big elephants in the room that the document that I've read today seems to skirt around? It's the Taliban having taken over Afghanistan. Your country shares a border, quite a porous border in some areas, of 2,640 kilometres between Pakistan and Afghanistan. That's elephant number one. Elephant number two is Kashmir. And until you resolve or work with those two big issues and get them both moving in the right direction, this idea of reinventing the country, direction of travel, is a non-starter until you work through those issues, not skirt around them. First of all, I'm not sure I've, uh, we've skirted around them. On Afghanistan, the elephant in the room is not the Taliban coming in or not. The elephant in the room, if you want to call it that, is a lack of stability in Afghanistan. And that's why it's very clearly stated there, even in the public uh, document, that at all costs, Pakistan needs and wants an Afghanistan that's stable. That's why since um, years, but also uh, since the Taliban came in, we've been going around to everybody in the world and saying, make sure we provide enough assistance to average Afghans that the country doesn't collapse. Because if it collapses, Pakistan gets refugees, there's a terrorism problem, we don't get the kind of connectivity we need for our economic growth with Central Asia and Eurasia, etc. So there's no skirting around that. We need that and we will work for that and do whatever we can. And we hope that the world will do the right thing by becoming a partner in that. Okay. As far as Kashmir is concerned, again, I think it's laid out fairly clearly. Uh, unfortunately, it takes two to tango. And in that case, uh, our eastern flank right now is exhibiting a behavior in terms of an Indian government that uh, I don't need to say much. All of the Western press, Middle Eastern press is covering it every day. Uh, the way they're approaching uh, this extremist Hindutva ideology, what they're doing with minorities, they believe that nobody else in the region uh, possibly has the right to exist. They've picked up a fight with China, uh, their relations with every neighbor is jaundiced right now. It can't be that the entire region has gone bonkers. The problem is that you've got a fascist regime in India. Unfortunately, the world has closed its eyes because they think it's going to become a counterweight to China or whatever it is. The only counter this country is playing is unto itself. It's very, very unfortunate. It's the largest country in South Asia. Uh, but I, I see very, very bad times coming um, ahead for India. Now, till that is the case, there is no logic that can be applied. I mean, it's, it's not okay. rationality. It's ideology. It's an Mr. Yusuf, I'm going to pause you there, sir, and say thank you very much. But we have nobody from the Indian government directly to respond to what you've just said. But thank you so much for joining no, us from no, Lahore. Uh, Moed Yusuf there, uh, an advisor to thank the... You. Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan. OK, let's go to our guest joining us from Islamabad, Shiraz Parasha, defence and strategy analyst. And in Lahore, we have Rabia Akhtar, 
the Director for Security, Strategy and Policy Research at the University of Lahore. To both of you, a warm welcome to Inside Story. Uh, Shiraz, coming to you first. You were listening there to my conversation with Mr Youssef in Lahore. On the one hand, it's touchy-feely international diplomacy, but he wrapped up the conversation by describing the Indian government as a fascist state. Yes, uh, this is uh, uh, indeed a problem with Pakistan's, uh, you know, uh, relationship, its perception of India. And uh, Pakistani, you know, they, many of them in Pakistani establishment, military people in politics, they proudly say we are India centric. And uh, in a way, enmity with India is celebrated in Pakistan and it's happening for the last 70 years, since 1948. We are stuck in, in, a, in, a, in a situation where this mindset that India is seen as an enemy and we want to wipe up India from the world map and India wants to wipe up or destroy Pakistan. Unless this mindset, this narrative changes, I don't think a real meaningful change will occur. In this uh, uh, policy, which they are you know, um, spinning and saying and promoting as the first ever national policy, it could have been, uh, you know, meaningful, real meaningful, if Pakistan would say that India is our rival in a very, you know, in a healthy way. Rival could be, you know, in economics, in trade, in different, you know, not a, an enemy which we aim to destroy and the enemy wants to destroy us. So this is a problem. Rabia in Lahore, these broad brush strokes of intent sound fantastic. They look really good on paper. The reality is it's going to cost and cost a lot of money. Pakistan already has record levels of external borrowing. Where does the money or the economy come from to generate the cash to pay for all this? To, just to uh, you know, contextualize this, I uh, do foresee this national security policy as a paradigm shift because it puts me as a citizen of Pakistan and an individual at the heart of it. But while it does that, it does not take anything away from the traditional threats that are facing Pakistan, and India is one of them. Uh, as my fellow panelists said that these threats by India are celebrated in Pakistan, I don't think they are celebrated. I don't think anybody in Pakistan wants war with India because firstly, like you mentioned, and we quoted the figures, we don't have the money to fight a war. We don't have money to sustain a war. We have barely have money to you know, uh, modernize our conventional military and nuclear modernization as uh, you know, India uh, continues to modernize. So right now, yes, I don't think Pakistan has the kind of money uh, with an external debt that's reaching 127 billion plus. Um, the only hope is that Pakistan's GDP growth is projected to touch a four-year high of 5% in the fiscal year, which ends in June 2022. But at the same time, the reality in Pakistan is that there is heightened inflation. There is a balance of payment crisis, which is dependent on external debt bailouts if, if Pakistan wants to stay afloat. Um, so from my understanding is that if Pakistan reprioritizes peace, uh, economic security, puts human security at the heart of it, then the broader piece of the national uh, economy pie that Dr. Muid Yusuf was talking about, that's the only way Pakistan can redirect its resources. If it continuously lives in an environment of geopolitical, geostrategic environment, which forces it uh, you know, to have a border which is hostile on the eastern side and then also a western border which is unstable and fragile, it will never be able to focus and achieve the objectives that this NSP focuses on. Shiraz Parasha in Islamabad there. Clearly, the strategic balance, that's the catch-all phrase that this new document uses, the strategic balance has been out of kilter. It hasn't meshed properly in so many areas be it exports not matching imports, be it the way the country spends too much money on defence, because the country's existence, its being, I guess, is a function of feeling constantly under threat. How do they rebalance that strategy? How do they 
spin all these plates into a state of equilibrium? The thing is, in, in, in my view, uh, this, uh, this feeling of insecurity is a kind of, I, I believe it's orchestrated. It's, it's, it's not a real threat in the, in, the, in the meanings of it, but Pakistanis are told, the public is told here for the last 70 years that we are a security state because we are under threat. Someone, particularly India, wants to destroy us. I am I'm of the view that India is not in the interest of India to destroy Pakistan. Yes, India may want to keep Pakistan weaker. They want maybe low intensity uh, instability in Pakistan could be in their interest, but wiping off Pakistan or destroying Pakistan is not in the interest of India or any uh, countries on Pakistani borders. So first of all, we need to look into, you know, some. we need to do some soul searching. And when we are saying this is the first ever national security policy, I would like to see that kind of, you know, critical thinking uh, in such policies that, yes, these were our, you know, we need to review our policies, our, our thinking, our mindset, our strategy. Um, my colleague, fellow colleague here, panelist, she is right. Pakistan cannot afford a, a war. Pakistan cannot afford confrontation. We need to reduce our defense expenses. We need to bring, you know, the structural uh, changes to our defense and security forces. In this document, they, they talk about cyber war, they talk about electronic war, they talk about, you know, hybrid war, and they want to allocate more, uh, you know, resources to th those new areas of defense. But at the same time, they want to keep the traditional spending. So if in this national security document, um, they, they could like, uh, we, we might uh, talk about, think about reducing the number of personnel. Okay. Um, and now the, the, in, the environment has changed. Uh, so, you know, why not that? Understood. Uh, that's uh, why I think we... The, just let me pause yes, you there, uh, Shiraz, just, just the next couple of minutes. Uh, Rabia Akhtar in Lahore. When they talk about a civil military consensus, is that clever diplomatic speak for we have spoken to the military and we have reassured them, look, it's OK? Because the military in Pakistan never really goes away. I mean, it was the military in Pakistan that gave us Pervez Musharraf. You know, he started the job wearing a military uniform and then he did the classic thing, he flipped over to wearing a collar and tie. If you're my age... I remember covering the story when the military was literally scaling the walls of the presidential palace. You're right, but military never goes away in any country. So this is Pakistan we are speaking, so it's exceptional in that case, given its history. Um, you know, when we say there is a civil military consensus on this national security policy, it just probably is to solve some fears that, listen, we're talking about economic security, but this economic security is not going to come at the cost of state or territorial security. Uh, uh, like Paracha Saab said, uh, there, is a, there is a section in this national security policy which talks about conventional threats. And this is perhaps the first time that Pakistan in its national security document has talked about five domains of warfare where wars are going to be fought. And in addition to land, air, and sea, there is uh, the domain of cyber and space added to it. Uh, Pakistan is talking about increased capabilities and in network centricity, battlefield awareness, electronic warfare capabilities, and other force multipliers that Pakistan will have to look at. So, okay. so this is not only an economic security paradigm which is devoid or divorced from the state security uh, paradigm. Uh, Shiraz Parasha in Islamabad, there's, there's something almost completely unique about your country and it's the way that the people who've got to be invested in what Imran Khan says he now wants to achieve, they have lived with, for two or three generations now, both internal and external threats. That is pretty unique, not only in the region, but in the world. So that there is a paradox there, that here, here we have a Pakistani prime minister setting himself up and saying, I'm the guy to deal with internal threats and external threats as well. When we talk about Kashmir, when we talk about Afghanistan, when we talk about the Afghan Taliban and also the Pakistani Taliban as well. I think you're right when you say about that Pakistan is unique. Pakistan is unique because these so-called 
threats are mostly perceived people behind the closed doors. They sit down and they decide and they think that we have these threats and they then they come out um, in the public and then they lecture the public that we have these threats, uh, which are, you know, um, for our, to our existence. Um, but in, 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 in reality, the state of Pakistan never consulted the actual, the real, the true stakeholders, the owners of Pakistan, the people of Pakistan, even in this document, which is, you know, a, is presented as one as the first ever policy, where are the stake, where is the input of Pakistani people? Where, you know, opposition, civil society, um, uh, they just said this is this is a civil military. Um, you know, we, we talk about civil military balance, but where where are the civilians? So in fact, they, in this document, they say about uh, national uh, cohesion. Cohesion uh, means: uh, uh, Do you want to bring it by force? Do you want to bring it, uh, impose it upon the people? Uh, a, the national identity and national cohesion. It it comes when you engage with people. It comes when you decentralize and devolve power. In Pakistan, we we have been focusing on centralizing the state and the strong center, a strong military can protect Pakistan. That model has failed. Okay, we Rabia, are uh, just come back to Rabia for a second, please, Shiraz. Um, with that idea of imposition in mind, Rabia, uh, I've dug out a quote from Benazir Bhutto, which she, she, I think she, she said this on American television not long before she was assassinated. People left in Pakistan, they are left in Pakistan with the remnants of the Soviet-Afghan war, trained militants, drug mafias, arms smuggling, and religious zealots. Even if she was only half right when she says that, doesn't that mean that what's gone before and what may come in the future, because Imran Khan is a here today, gone tomorrow politician. Doesn't that mean that this document they've now come up with has to be a living document? It, it will have to change because in a year or two or 10, the three of us could be having another conversation, Rabia, about the new prime minister or the new president or the new military who's taken over. Absolutely, Peter. But before I answer this question, I'd like to say that the threats Pakistan faces uh, pertaining to the common raid by uh, Shirasam uh, is not just a perceived threat. When the Indian uh, defense minister comes out and you know talks about changing the NFU status and taking over AJK by force, uh, there is some reality to it. So it's not all in the head. It's not a ghost that's been made up by somebody. Coming to your question, um, the quote that you have quoted from Venezuela Bhutto, I think she was absolutely right. Uh, in the past 20 years, you know, we have suffered. We have lost 70,000 plus lives and we have lost $78 million worth of economic worth in these years. That's the price Pakistan has paid. When my prime minister, I'm just talking here as an individual, as a citizen, when he comes out and he says that this policy is about securing me as an individual, as a citizen of Pakistan, whether it is about securing my constitutional privileges or is it about protecting me from all forms of extremism, crime, terrorism, violence, including war and gender-based violence, which by the way, has made its way into this NSP for the first time in the history of Pakistan, then I will, have hope about it. This is a comprehensive approach, which is which had been missing previously. So this NSP is talking about rule of law. NSP is talking about responsive justice. It's talking about uh, making it a Pakistan where its elite and its wealthy people don't take money out of the country and invest it in countries and banks abroad, but rather make Pakistan a priority. Invest in Pakistan and make this a place worth investing in. So what's not to be hopeful about? This is a policy which is from 2022 to 2026. It's only a four years time frame. Now, no policy can achieve this objective in this point in time. This is also, I would like to say, I don't see this as I'm apolitical. I don't see this as PTI's policy. Like Dr. Moeed Yusuf said in his opening statement that this should outlive any prime minister in Pakistan because of its comprehensive nature and anybody should have no objection, rather you should add more to it 
There is nothing in it that you would like to take out and say, no, because this government presented it, we don't agree with it. OK, so I Shiraz, think let's have Rabia, I'm about. going to have to stop you there. Otherwise, we're going to completely run out of time. Thank you both so much. They were our guests today, Shiraz Parasha and Rabia Akhtar. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the show again via the website, aljazeera.com. And you can also talk to us via Facebook. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also get more on the conversation on our Twitter handle at AJ Inside inside story from me, Peter Dobby, and the team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.